and welcome back to MLab 1101, Introduction to Clinical Laboratory Science. My name is Dustin Scott Brewster, and this is going to be the fourth of our six-part presentation series on clinical laboratory testing. In this presentation, we're going to cover the clinical chemistry department. To find the objectives for this presentation, log on to Blackboard. On the left-hand side, select the Schedule tab. Scroll down to unit number five, and within that row, you'll find a link for the objectives for this presentation. So why do we need a chemistry department in the clinical lab? The purpose of chemistry testing in the clinical lab are to measure substances found in the human body for the purpose of diagnosing, treating, and monitoring disease and metabolic conditions. The samples tested in a chemistry lab include plasma and serum blood samples, the difference being that plasma is collected with an anticoagulant, prevented from clotting, spun down, and the liquid portion still contains the clotting factors. Serum samples are allowed to clot and sometimes promoted to clot with a clot activator and are spun down. The clot and the cellular components go to the bottom of the tube and the liquid portion of a serum sample does not contain clotting factors. Other types of samples tested in a clinical chemistry lab include urine, pleural fluid, peritoneal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, and amniotic fluid. The types of substances tested on these body fluid types include enzymes, electrolytes, trace metals, and drug metabolites. Let's talk a little more about the difference between plasma and serum. Again, in plasma, there is an anticoagulant present in the tube, which prevents the blood from clotting. It's then spun down, the cellular components go to the bottom of the tube, and the liquid portion of the blood up top would still contain the clotting factors. This is plasma. The acceptable plasma yielding tubes in chemistry are green tubes and contain anticoagulant sodium heparin or lithium heparin. Lithium heparin is more often used in the clinical chemistry lab. Serum, on the other hand, does not contain any anticoagulant and often has a clot activator present. The sample is allowed to clot. It's then spun down. The clot and the cellular components go to the bottom of the tube because they're more dense. And the liquid portion of a serum sample would not contain clotting factors because the sample was allowed to clot and they go to the bottom of the tube. That's the difference between serum and plasma. Acceptable serum yielding tubes in the chemistry department include red top tubes, yellow top tubes, and tiger top tubes. Again, they do not contain an anticoagulant and often contain a clot activator. Different testing methodologies found in the clinical chemistry lab, depending on which lab you're at, what type of instrument is used, and what type of testing is done. You can find colorimetric methodology, which is an endpoint reaction where the color develops to the greatest extent of the reaction and then ceases. There are also kinetic reactions, which measure the speed and degree of change over a set period of time. There are spectrophotometric reactions, which measure the amount of light transmitted or absorbed by the reagent pad. Electrochemical reactions are a chemical reaction that measures the amount of electrons transferred and is how electrolytes are measured. There are also organ-specific tests that you can find in the clinical chemistry lab to give you an idea of the health of specific organ tissues. These include, but aren't limited to, troponin, which gives the healthcare provider an idea of the patient's heart health. Liver-specific tests include alanine aminotransferase, alkaline phosphatase, and many others. There are also kidney-specific tests, such as blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. In addition to those organ-specific tests, other things that are tested in the clinical chemistry department include therapeutic drugs, such as dilantin or phenytoin, valproic acid, and vancomycin. These drugs can reach a toxic level if not monitored, and therefore it's essential that these tests 
be drawn at specific times and reported back to the pharmacy to make sure the patient isn't receiving too much or too little of the therapeutic drug. Additional drugs that can be tested in the clinical chemistry lab include illicit drugs such as cocaine, marijuana, amphetamines, PCP, heroin, and many other substances. So factors that can affect certain testing include the time of collection. Certain hormones, for example, are higher in the morning and go down in the evening, so the time of collection for certain tests can be important. In addition to the time of collection, other factors that can affect a chemistry test include fasting, and if a patient ate directly before getting their blood drawn, depending on what's being tested. For example, glucose levels can rise shortly after eating, as well as low-density lipoproteins, high-density lipoproteins, and triglycerides. So certain things that can interfere with patient testing include lipemia. On the far left here, we have this cloudy, milky sample in the, this is a gold top tube, so this would be serum, and the serum portion of the tube is very cloudy and milky. This is the presence, this is due to the presence of lipids from most likely the patient not fasting before having their blood drawn. Obviously, this would interfere with a lipid panel test. In addition to that, we could have hemolysis where the red blood cells are lysed often during collection. Red blood cells contain potassium and releasing those potassium elements into the patient's blood can give a falsely elevated potassium result. Icteric samples are yellowish green and due to the elevation of bilirubin and can indicate the presence of liver disease. One of the most common interferences in the clinical lab are diluted or contaminated samples from IV blood draws. Diluted samples result from saline or fluid being inserted into the line and into the tube and ultimately tested and giving a falsely low lab value. Contaminated samples are usually the result of a contaminated product from the patient's IV getting into the patient's sample and interfering with one of the tests in the clinical chemistry department. So reference ranges in the chemistry department are values from a healthy population. The range of a normal healthy population is the reference range and each, chemical, each clinical chemistry test has a reference range assigned to it. Each of these tests are often bundled together in panels. Again, we talked about organ specific tests. If a practitioner wants to get an idea of the health of the liver of a patient or the heart, they can bundle tests together uh, to get a general idea using more than one tests. A basic approach would be a basic metabolic panel. A comprehensive metabolic panel is going to give a more in-depth view of a patient's general health. There's other organ-specific panels such as liver panels, cardiac panels, or thyroid panels, as well as panels for many illicit substances, and that is known as a drug screen. General tests that are run often on many of these panels include total proteins. Those total proteins are used as transport materials. They're, they function as clot formation substances, as well as immunity support. Abnormal levels can indicate the presence of liver disease or kidney disease. Glucose provides energy for cellular metabolism, and abnormal results can indicate hypoglycemia for low glucose levels or hyperglycemia for high glucose levels. Blood urea nitrogen is a byproduct of protein metabolism and abnormal results can indicate heart failure, dehydration, increase in a protein diet, or possibly kidney failure. Creatinine supplies energy to muscles and abnormal results can indicate kidney disease. Minerals tested in the clinical chemistry lab include calcium, 
which is used for muscle and nerve control as well as blood clotting and bone health. The significance of an abnormal calcium level could indicate kidney disease, bone development issues, or possibly malnutrition. Phosphorus is a mineral used for bone and teeth development, carbohydrate and fat metabolism, and abnormal results could reflect kidney disorder or possibly diabetes. Magnesium is used for nerve and muscle control, immune function, and it is used to maintain healthy bones and teeth. Abnormal results could indicate cardiac arrhythmia, chronic diarrhea, or a mineral imbalance. Iron is a component of red blood cells, which are used to transport oxygen in the circulatory system. Abnormal results could indicate an iron deficiency or an iron overload. So back to the testing panels to give a general idea of specific organ systems. For cardiac health, we have creatinine, which is used for cellular metabolism and storing and is stored in muscles. And a elevated level of creatine kinase could indicate muscle damage or possibly heart attack. More specific to cardiac tissue is troponin, which aids in muscle contraction in the heart, and elevated levels of troponin can indicate damage to the cardiac tissue and possibly heart attack. So troponin is the gold standard for evaluating the presence of a heart attack. Other panels, which I won't get into the specific of each one, include lipid panels, which include triglycerides, total cholesterol, high-density lipoprotein, and low-density lipoproteins. There are electrolytes that are tested and in part of most panels, and they include sodium, potassium, chloride, and carbon dioxide. These electrolytes are important to know. The function of each of those um, we will leave here, but we won't cover. Liver panel tests include alanine phosphatase, alanine aminotransferase, aspartate aminotransferase, and gamma glutamine transpeptidase. Each of them end in ACE because they are all enzymes. Thyroid panels include the hormones thyroid stimulating hormone, free thyroxine, free triiodothyronine, total try iodothyronine, but usually people just say free T3 and total T3. These hormones function in metabolism and can indicate the presence of hypo or hyperthyroidism depending on their values. Kidney panels include albumin, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, the ratio of blood urea nitrogen to creatinine, calcium, carbon dioxide, chloride, glomerular filtration rate, glucose, phosphorus, and sodium. To get a more general idea of a patient's general health, a basic metabolic panel can be ordered, which includes albumin, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, the ratio of blood urea nitrogen to creatinine, calcium, carbon dioxide, chloride, the GFR glomerular filtration rate, glucose, phosphorus, and sodium. And the big panel often run in chemistry to give a very comprehensive view of a patient's general health is the comprehensive metabolic panel or CMP. Tests on a CMP include albumin, alanine, aminotransferase, alkaline, phosphatase, aspartate, aminotransferase, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, chloride, the BUN creatinine ratio, calcium, carbon dioxide, chloride, the GFR, glucose, phosphorus, sodium, total bilirubin, and total protein. So this is going to give a practitioner a more comprehensive view of a patient's general health and includes several different organ systems. Based on the results of a comprehensive metabolic panel, a practitioner will know which direction to take his diagnosis in and give a better or holistic view of a patient's health. So that's going to conclude our presentation on the clinical chemistry department, and we will pick this back up with part five of
of our six-part series.